Today on the program, we discuss the Real ID Act. Congress passed the Real ID Act in 2005, enacting the 9-11 Commission's request that the federal government, quote, set standards for the issuance of sources of identification, such as driver's license. Has this act set new security standards, or is this simply a product of an overreaching government prying deeper into our personal lives? We will have activist Kay Beach on to discuss the Real ID Act and the implications it has on our personal freedom. Also, in sports, the Oklahoma City Thunder trailed the Portland Trailblazers Wednesday evening with a final score of 115 to 120. Today, Oklahoma City Thunder will be taking on the Sacramento Kings, so that means we will have sport contributors Justin Wright and Trey Shelton on the program to give us our Thunder update. But first, we welcome back to the program Representative Paul Wesselhoff. Paul, welcome back to Oklahoma Voice. Yes, I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. We're glad that you're back in the studio sitting in the co-host chair. We have a jam-packed show. And, uh, Paul, you know, I was looking uh, on the Internet, and I saw that the Oklahoman had written a little article and uh, calling you and Richard Morissette the political odd couple. And uh, anyone that knows Richard Morissette knows that he is a, uh, a staunch Democrat. And so many times you guys don't see eye to eye, but there is one thing you do see eye to eye eye on and that is OU basketball. Well that's true Richard and I have been friends uh, we came in together as legislators and uh, yeah we go toe-to-toe -to -toe on the floor of the house and uh, he's a uh, liberal Democrat and I'm a conservative Republican so we rub each other uh, pretty uh, awfully sometimes uh, <laughs> but when we leave the uh, floor of the House of Representatives we are the friends that we came in to be and uh, we've gone to a number of Thunder uh, the basketball games and OU football games. And here recently, we went to the Final Four. So, yes, we're good friends. And quite frankly, yeah, people call us the political odd couple. But I think we present a good model. I don't know why these two parties cannot get along better. Obviously, that's what's not happening on the national level. And that's why we have so much gridlock in D.C. is because uh, these people are not the friends that they used to be. Uh, they're so politically driven that it's hard for them to form uh, bonds of friendship. Mm -hmm. And see, it doesn't have to be odd at all. And, uh, you know, I know a lot of uh, elected legislators that are friends with somebody on the opposite side of the aisle. That's true. Yeah, that's true. But we had a lot of fun going down to uh, Houston. Uh, the ironic thing is uh, the tickets that we ha we were provided to us, actually we paid for them, but President David Bourne made the tickets available to us. And so we drove down there and unfortunately OU lost on Saturday, so we didn't stay around to Monday to watch the championship. But we got to watch the, the final four uh, play uh, on Saturday, and so we had a lot of fun. We stayed at my son's apartment, and uh, Richard slept on the floor on an air mattress. <laughs> and uh, at one point, he started snoring, so I took my shoe and I popped him with it. Hey! And uh, that, that 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 brought the snoring to a to a halt, and so we were able to make it through the night. All right. Well, wow. okay. Well, that's a good report for the most part. And uh, you know, you were talking about uh, President David Boren, and we know that. Uh, 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 President Boren and you have somewhat uh, been going at it in the sense of uh, trying to get those uh, uh, paintings, then that artwork, back to its rightful owner. And uh, transitioning into that, I couldn't help but notice on your Facebook page that you were working to propose a resolution in the Oklahoma House called the Holocaust Expropriated Art Recovery Act. And uh, why don't you tell us the purpose of this resolution and why you're choosing to shed light on this issue? Well, you probably know that we passed a resolution in the Oklahoma House of Representatives unanimously, and everybody became a co-author as well. Uh, and that resolution uh, encouraged, uh, actually conjoled, the University of Oklahoma to, to uh, re do research on all of their art. So if they find out that art was stolen by the Nazis, that they would return it to the rightful owner. And I think that that document, uh, because when you pass a resolution on the House of Representatives, you're expressing the will, even though it's not a law, you're expressing the will of that body. So that body was telling President uh, Boren 
we want you to do the right thing, do the research that you should do, and return the art. And I think that was the thing that really persuaded him eventually uh, to stop fighting this in court and come to a settlement. And uh, the very fortunate thing is uh, in, this summer, probably close to the July 4th week, weekend, I'll be going to Paris uh, accompanying that art and giving it to the rightful owner, Mrs. Meyer, in Paris. And so I'm very thrilled to be able to, uh, to fly over and give that art to her. Excellent. And before the show, we were talking about uh, somebody else trying to pass an act like this, but I think you had already beat them to it. So you're kind of the front runner in this deal. That's correct. Uh, yes, we uh, the the U.S. Congress. I just heard on the news last night. Uh, matter of fact, um, Senator Cruz and Senator Schumer talk about a political odd couple. Uh. <laughs> they are the authors of this particular bill that you just mentioned. Uh -huh. And the whole idea of that bill is to return stolen art, uh, the, the Nazis uh, uh, stolen during World War II, to their rightful owners. So actually we beat the U.S. Congress here in Oklahoma, but that's not the first time that we've uh, passed things in Oklahoma that Congress has uh, looked at us and said, you know, that's a pretty good idea. Maybe we should do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And here on Oklahoma Voice, we want to uh, be able to continue this conversation uh, about uh, this art recovery and this particular act. And uh, so Representative Wesselhoff will be back on the program more to uh, kind of delve into this issue and uh, perhaps have another guest. Uh, could you tell us about that guest you're wanting to have on? Yes, my colleague in this whole campaign has been, well, I've had two colleagues. One former representative, Mike Reynolds, has been very instrumental. But the other one is a student at the University of Oklahoma. His name is Eric Sunby. And he founded an organization at OU uh, that emphasizes uh, to teach uh, students, you know, not to be anti-Semitic, to be sensitive to Jewish issues, and especially returning stolen art. So he's a very bright young man, and uh, we'd love to have him on our show, and I look forward to that uh, program. Yes, we cannot wait to, to listen to him, and because uh, it sounds like he's got a brilliant mind, and it'll be perfect for this conversation. You know, I'm wanting to shift gears a little bit, and uh, I'm wanting to talk about your drone bill, House Bill 2337. It was killed in the Oklahoma Senate, and I believe the chairman of the committee did not give your Senate author, Rob Standridge, a hearing. Is that correct? That's correct. That's uh, Senator Barrington. Uh, he didn't even give the bill a hearing. I'm sure he got lobbied strongly by the Highway Patrol and other people that don't want any restrictions on drones. So unfortunately, uh, the bill wasn't heard and it dies this year. Maybe another uh, representative will bring it up in a couple of years. Uh, I think it's very important. Frankly, I think Congress someday will come out with federal laws pertaining to drones. Let me just kind of create a little world for you mm -hmm. for a moment so Please. you know, so our listeners will understand about drones. You have to realize that drones, uh, if not now, will soon be ubiquitous. Now, that's a, that's a word that means everywhere, and they're going to be everywhere. You can buy a drone today for about $1,000, and you can put sophisticated equipment like photography on it. Matter of fact, my son, his hobby is photography, and he's going to buy a drone. Uh, the prices will come down uh, uh, in the near future, and a lot of people will have drones. I may even get one someday. And uh, you have to realize that drones come in sizes anywhere from the size of a sparrow to a 747. Now, why do I say 747? Well, I was in Israel recently, and as a state representative, I got a tour of one of their military bases uh, that has all kinds of drones on it. Now, they didn't show me the 747, but I have mm -hmm. read that Israel has a drone, an unmanned aerial vehicle, 747. Now, what they're going to do with that, I don't know, but they have it. And so you you have to un realize that in the next 10 to 20 years, this this is a new frontier. These drones are, are, are new. It's a new frontier. And, of course, we see them utilized in, in our war efforts in the Middle East uh, when they're weaponized. But I'm talking about for commercial use. Uh, I predict in the next 10 to 20 years, uh, when it comes to like UPS delivering packages, you're not going to see pilots do that. Why would UPS hire a pilot, pay their insurance, their medical benefits, their retirement, their salary, when they can transport all that equipment with a drone? And that's what's going to happen. 
they're going to be pilotless UPS. So look for that. That's going to happen in the future. It might hmm. be 10 years out there. It may be 20. I frankly, I'm not a young man anymore, but I think I'll see that in my lifetime. Now, as far as passenger flight, I don't think the human being is quite psychologically equipped to be on an aircraft without a pilot. Now, maybe in the next you know, 50 years when people are so conditioned to drones, uh, maybe that'll be the case, but I don't think that's going to happen in the near future. Frankly, I don't want to be on an aircraft that, without a pilot. Mm -hmm. I'm just not psychologically pre prepared for that. Yeah. But when it comes to, to commerce, Jonathan, you're going to see, you're going to see that, uh, that that's just going to happen. And uh, so you're going to see drones everywhere. So mm -hmm. that, that's the world we live in. But it's a new frontier without any laws, without any restrictions, other than the FAA recently came out with certain restrictions on how high they can fly, how fast they can fly, those kinds of safety issues. But there are no regulations to unmanned aerial vehicle, vehicles as far as invading people's privacy. And that's what my bill did. My bill essentially said that if law enforcement is going to target you for surveillance, then they must suspect that you're going to commit a crime or have committed a crime or are about to commit a crime, in which case my bill requires of them to get a warrant to surveil you. Mm -hmm. And we have a judge that's on call 24 hours a day. They rotate the duty. They're on call to issue warrants, so it's not even difficult. And even if the police <clears throat> needed to get to a location and surveil somebody uh, without, go you know, immediately, they could do that in my bill, but then they would have 48 hours to get back to the judge and explain why they did not have the time to get a warrant. So my bill was very generous, and all it did was lay out groundwork uh, for the law enforcement, how they are going to conduct themselves when they're surveilling people. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a constitutional issue with me in the Fourth Amendment. Uh, the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution says the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches shall not be violated. And then it goes on to say that no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause. So if I'm being surveilled and I'm an innocent c citizen, I haven't done anything wrong and if they're spying on me, then they are breaking the Fourth uh, Amendment of the Constitution. So my bill was the strongest Fourth Amendment bill that's probably been presented in the last several years. And unfortunately, it, uh, it wasn't given a hearing. And I believe uh, even in your post, you say that your bill was generous enough that the law enforcement could perform a drone uh, surveillance in an emergency without a warrant and then in 48 hours explain and support their reasoning to a judge. That's, that's correct. That's correct. And let me make a comment about uh, legislators not hearing bills. Uh, I am one of two legislators in the House that hear every bill that comes into my committee. We give every bill a hearing, and we vote it up or down. And sometimes I'm against the bill that I'm hearing, and I debate against it. And this last year, this session, I've actually killed one of my Republican colleagues' bill in the committee because I debated against it, and I won the debate, and more people voted against the bill than for it. Frankly, I think that's how you should conduct a committee. But what, think about this. When, when I, in the House, if I refuse to hear one of my colleagues' bills, Republican colleague or even Democrat, what I'm basically telling that person is I have better judgment than you do that your bill should get a hearing. Now, take that up a step, and when you refuse to hear a bill that was passed in the other chamber, then it's not one-on-one. -on -one. The, the chairman is basically telling the other legislator, uh, I'm not going to hear your bill, even though it was passed in the Senate, because I have better judgment than all those senators over there that passed that bill. To me, that is the height of arrogance, and it's abuse of power. And that's one of my frustrations in the last 12 years is, uh, is, is these, these chairmen that uh, are so brilliant that they know better about your bill than you do, mm -hmm. even though it passes out of a chamber, and they don't give it an up or down vote. Quite frankly, sometimes they don't even want to go on record 
in the committee as voting for a particular bill, so they won't even hear it. So that's just one of my frustrations I wanted to, to kind mm. of get out there. But, uh, but I think in the future someone will probably pick this bill up. Uh, and, and frankly, I think Congress at some point, U.S. Congress, will have to come out with some regulations. Think of another angle on these drones, Jonathan. If you're an attorney and you're fighting for your client, say, uh, for child custody, do you think you're not going to use a drone to surveil the spouse to see what the spouse is up to? Sure. I mean, there's just all kinds of ramifications on how drones can be utilized and surveil people. And right now... There are no rules. There's no regulations. And that's all my bill was uh, asking to do. But unfortunately, it didn't get a hearing in the Senate. But uh, perhaps it'll come up in a couple of years by another author. My question is, when something like that does happen, uh, isn't there a certain percentage of votes that could somewhat resurrect that bill or bring it back to be heard? Not if it's not given a hearing uh, in the other chamber. Now, in, in, in the chamber that I'm a member of in the House, if a committee chairman refuses to hear my bill, then I could do a petition and get, uh, I think it's like 67 votes or 67 signatures that would force the bill out of the committee and onto the floor. Uh -huh. But that's quite an ordeal to try to get 67 right. votes just to get a bill heard. And frankly, I just don't think it's fair. It's just so anti-democratic to me mm -hmm. that, that we would have to go through those kind of hoops just to have a bill heard. It's just so easy. Just hear the bill, debate it, and vote it up or down. If it's not a good bill, then vote against it. It just seems so simple to me. But unfortunately, myself and maybe two other legislators are the only ones that give every bill a hearing. Hmm. Well, we appreciate that, and we appreciate you laying this groundwork. We uh, are, uh, it's unfortunate that it did not get heard, but uh, our, our hopes is that somebody will, as you say, uh, uh, pick this up and run with it in the future. I certainly hope so. Folks, switching topics, we're going to discuss a little about the Real ID Act. And we have a guest that we have decided to call, and uh, her name is Kay Beach. She has been an activist, and uh, she has been speaking loudly against the Real ID Act, and uh, she has some good ideas on which direction we need to go as a state and as a nation to defend our own personal freedom. Kay, are you there? I am. How are you doing, Jonathan? We are excellent, Kay, and uh, we have Representative Paul Wesselhoff here with us as well. And... Uh, Representative, would you please uh, kind of set the stage for us so we can understand what this Real ID Act is? Yes, uh, the Real ID Act is uh, at our legislature at this point. It passed out of the Senate. Uh, it came over to a committee in uh, appropriations and budget of which I'm a member. I voted against it, uh, but more people voted for it. So now it's headed to the floor of the House. If it passes on the floor, uh, then it's sent to the governor. I'm not sure where the governor is on this, but uh, she's not a constitutional conservative, so I suspect that she might uh, pass it. Uh, you might keep in mind the Real ID Act uh, came out of Congress, I think, in 2005, and basically there are about 20 uh, states that have refused to implement the Real ID, and uh, I think it's an intrusion of government. Uh, when you read the Constitution, when you look at the Tenth Amendment, it says the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution are reserved to the states respectively. Well, there's nothing in the Constitution that I see that tells uh, me that the federal government has the power and authority to force the states uh, to come up with another identification card. And uh, their abuse of power is that if you don't have this card, then they're going to tell you, I think in 2018, that you can't fly out of Will Rogers Airport to some other state. They're going to refuse to let you go on board. Now, Jonathan, this is not television. This is radio. So I'm taking out my identifications out of my billfold. And, Kay, this, you ought to be interested in this. First, I have the driver's license, and, and Kay will talk about that. Mm -hmm. And we are told it's one of the most secured uh, driver's license in, in the United States. It has a chip in it. It's biometric, so it's very, very secure. In 2018, that will not get me on an airplane. Hmm. I also have here my concealed weapon license with my picture. It's official. That won't get me on the plane in 2018, the federal government tells me. 
Then I have another official document uh, here with my picture on it, which shows I'm a member of the House of Representatives. That won't get me on a plane. I'm a citizen of the Potawatomi Nation. I'm a Native American, and we are a sovereign tribe. And they issue uh, a, a, a permit, a identification with my picture. That will not get me on the plane. It'll get me on the plane right now. But in 2018, the federal government says that won't work. Last identification here. I'm a retired military officer, so I have a United States Uniformed Services identification card. This is probably a lot more secure than my driver's license. Uh, this is a very sensitive card. Uh, if I should lose this, I'm actually in trouble. That's got my picture on it. So, Jonathan, I took out hmm. of my billfold five official identifications, IDs, mm -hmm. all, all with, with my photos. photos on it. And in 2018, the federal government's going to tell me, no, you need a sixth ID. You need a real ID. And if you don't have it, we're not going to let you fly. And I just mm -hmm. think that's abuse of power, and it's overreached by the federal government. And, uh, and I'd sure like to have Kay's uh, thoughts on that as well. And you might keep in mind that Kay, was, uh, she uh, refused at one point to actually even get a driver's license because of its uh, invasion. Uh, this real ID is even more so an invasion of her privacy. And uh, as you said earlier, Paul, you know, there's nothing in this Constitution that says that we have to do this. And that is how we call it an overreach. So, Kay, in the, about the five minutes that we have, can you please enlighten us on the this subject? Well, let me see. First of all, you're both absolutely correct. Uh, the issuance of driver's license and ID card is absolutely a state function. The federal government cannot force the states to do anything different with it, and it's important for people to know that real ID is not a mandate. And all of the threats that Representative Wesselhoff was talking about, that you're not going to be able to fly after a certain date if you don't have a certain ID, is that is an example of the stick. They've used the carrot and the stick to get states to accept this, and, and that is because they cannot force the states to do it. However, we are really close. Uh, I, I agree with Representative Wesselhoff. The way it looks now, this is going to pass, and I'm going to go back to my original purpose as an activist, going back to about 2007, real ID is a problem. Biometric ID is a bigger problem. It is the worst problem. And we talked about this earlier on the phone, uh, Jonathan, that our driver's license are currently, uh, they require our biometric data, and people know they require their finger to be scanned, but they also require a, a biometric photo, which is not the same as a regular photo. Right. This photo can be used uh, through digital means to identify you from a distance without your knowledge or consent. A whole different ballgame than a photo. So the biometric ID to me is the worst thing, and, and Rep Representative Wesselhoff is right. I refuse to have a biometric ID. Introducing our bodies into the identity equation when we're not criminals or suspects is a huge mistake. Most people aren't aware that they have a biometric identification under the state driver's license or ID. And by the time they become aware, I'm afraid that it's going to be too late uh, because it's going to start affecting their, their lives adversely. As I told you earlier, Jonathan, that the federal government has a big plan for these state databases. And under Real ID, these databases must be networked in together and that information shared. And the big plans include things like uh, requiring you to have a Real ID and using your biometric photo as your passport to work for a living. You would have to be approved by the federal government to work. This was actually in the immigration reform bill. Mind you, 95% of the people in the United States are citizens. And... You cannot say that something is a right if you have to have permission to exercise it. Mm -hmm. And if working for a living is not a right, I don't know what is. <laughs> so my biggest concern is about the biometric ID, and I have refused it. I think that's the only thing that's going to stop it is refusing it, is people refusing it. Um, but like I said, most people don't even know that that's happening. And the fact of the matter is that all states, are capturing 
biometric photos, and at least 38 states, last time I checked, are actively using that photo for facial recognition purposes. That's a fact. And, and Kay, what's been the repercussions on your life uh, refusing this license? Ha, ha, has the government come after you on this? No, but I can't drive. Um, I can't. Uh, I had a great deal of trouble just picking up my prescriptions because apparently there's a rule that you have to have a government issued photo ID, which means a biometric ID. Um, so, in essence, I'm having to trade my biometrics to pick up my medicine. Um, I mean, silly things like uh, writing out a check and showing my ID in my neighborhood association so that my daughter can swim there, get a membership to swim there. I don't have an ID. And so I've learned to cope with it, and, and, and I can cope with it now. But if we go ahead and agree to real ID and then lose the state's biometric databases to be used and shared widely, um, that's going to change. Mm -hmm. I, I will probably have a much more difficult time functioning. Mm -hmm. And I think that people will find out what control is really about. And the problem with the biometric, I, I know this is an unfamiliar topic to most people. You, people understand how the social security number was a concern because you've got a unique number that's linking all of these other sources of data about you, which makes your life very transparent to the government. Well, your biometric is even a more unique number, and it, you cannot divorce yourself from your body. And so this puts you uh, puts your life in, in a state of transparency to the government that is untenable if you really think about it. Well, Kay, that has been very interesting, and uh, we thank you so much for coming on and sharing this with us. Uh, unfortunately, we are uh, out of time for this uh, particular segment, uh, but we would love for you to be able to come back on and to give us an update on this and to keep us informed on this subject. Well, thank you very much. I would be uh, very pleased to do so, and thank you for inviting me. And, and Representative Westhoff, good to hear your voice, and I hope you both have a great night. Thank you, Kay. We appreciate it, Kay. And folks, last but most certainly not least, we have Justin Wright from ThunderOpEd.com joining us, and uh, he will be giving us our weekly uh, Oklahoma City Thunder update. As I said before, uh, the we lost to the Portland Trailblazers Wednesday evening, and uh, we'll be taking on the Sacramento Kings today. So, uh, Justin, welcome back to Oklahoma Voice, and uh, give us a rundown. Well, uh, you know, honestly, I think it's over an 82-game season, you start to get a little burnt out. Um, I'm not going to lie, I'm a little burnt out myself. Uh, I'm just ready for the playoffs to get here. Luckily, we've already clinched that spot, so not that big of a deal, just kind of waiting until uh, next Saturday. What it looks like is going to come down, uh, down the stretch here. We've got Memphis currently at the 5 and Portland at the 6. You don't really want to play Portland if you're the Oklahoma State Thunder. They match up a little bit better. And given the injury situation that the, that the Grizzlies have had this season, it seems like the more favorable matchup. But obviously, that's not in the Thunder's control, so we'll just kind of see what happens in those games. And ultimately, this team has to be ready to play. They rested four starters against the Portland Trailblazers, only lost by five. Got to see a lot of the bench and what the bench can do, especially what Ennis Cantor can do when he has the ball in his hands more. Obviously, if he doesn't get the playing time he needs, he's not going to be as effective. But something moving into the playoffs, and especially as matchups dictate, let's see how much Ennis Cantor can really do when he's got the ball in his hands, especially in crunch time. I think he could be one of the X factors, especially on a team where there are three players in the top ten in PER, something that hasn't been done ever. No team has ever had two players in the top ten in the PER. Oklahoma State has three with Westbrook, Durant, and in this canter, this team certainly has the firepower. Where does the defense step up in the big moments to win games? All right. Well, Justin, uh, can you give us your Twitter handle one more time for us? Yes, it's at ThunderTie, exactly what it sounds like, T-H-U-N-D-E-R-T-I-E. All right, Justin. Hey, thank you so much. We're going to be keeping our eyes peeled, and we're going to be keeping our fingers crossed. All right, thanks for having me, John. Okay, we appreciate it, Justin. And uh, Representative Wesselhoff, we thank you so much again for joining Oklahoma Voice, and uh, we look forward to you coming back on so we can discuss more about this art. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I want to encourage listeners to contact their 
uh, House of Representative uh, representative member and encourage them not to vote for the Real ID Act, which will be on the floor probably next week or the week after. Excellent. So do not vote for the Real ID Act. Contact your legislators, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for listening to Oklahoma Voice. I am Jonathan Clore. Good night.